Dr. Nubar Afarian, thank you so much for being with me this morning to discuss something that I think is so important and so timely, the future of Armenia, an initiative that you began because you're focusing on not just the immediate necessity of what this country needs, but about the future. You're focused on what it needs down the line in order to succeed. Talk to me a little bit about how you came up with this idea and what really motivated you to think in this way. Well, it's it's a pleasure to speak to you, Axia. And uh, you know, the thinking about the future uh, is much of what I do quite separately from our Armenian activities, and that's you know, in the field of innovation and in the field of transformation, um, it's difficult to bring about real change if you only think about the past and the present, because change, breakthroughs, transformation are really a gateway to a better future. Uh, in fact, I've uh, talked a lot about my own experience as an immigrant and the degree to which innovation feels like immigration, change feels like immigration because you kind of change what you, where you are to where you wanna be. Uh, and, and that's why people immigrate. Sometimes they're forced to immigrate, but in any event, wherever they land, they imagine a better reality for themselves. And, and that's kind of what, what it takes to also change a country. So I think the future is an important element uh, of any discussion about the present. And uh, I've believed that for a long time. Um, part of it is influenced by my life for 34 years in startups, but also part of it is born out of the work we've done in Armenia since back in 2001, where together with colleagues, we started the Armenia 2020 project, which back then was about the future. And it mm -hmm. informed us about what could be possibly happening in 2020 um, unfortunately, we didn't imagine quite what did happen in 2020, which was a global pandemic plus a catastrophic uh, a confrontation that affected the security of Armenia. But in any event, we thought about 2020 back in 2000, and it guided us. And I think we need to be doing much the same today, thinking ahead of 2041, which will be the 50th anniversary of the formation of our most recent independent republic, and ask ourselves, where do we want to get to? And then what are the steps that might take us in that direction? So you have laid out 15 objectives, these 15 objectives, which we can go through and quickly highlight um, what each of those things entail and why you're focused on each of those points. Let's begin with the first, for example, the vision setting, which obviously is important because we all have to have the same vision so we can work toward that goal. Let me start by just saying, you know, why you asked me, why, why are we doing this now? And of course we are uh, recognizing that, that as a young independent Republic, Armenia is facing some pretty uh, unprecedented challenges as a country. Uh, we've faced those as people before when we've lived in other people's lands, but as a country, we really, you know, it feels to many of us like we are in some dangers beyond what we envisioned possible. That is to our security, that is to our economic uh, uh, sustainability, and that is to our overall society and how the country functions. It's a, it's a pretty uh, important moment. And, and I say important rather than dangerous, challenging, because that's what it takes for countries to to build themselves. And so I think this moment is important. And so as a, as a group of folks that are concerned about this moment, we kind of asked, what could we do uh, to add to the, to the debate, add to the discussion? And, and so we, we looked around at how the world treats these types of issues. These are macro, big issues that transcend any one dimension. It's not politics only. It's not prosperity only. It's not any number of things, everything. And so we, we, we took some uh, uh, encouragement and lessons from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the, the, the SDGs, which were introduced some years ago as a framework for all countries, all people around the planet to be able to have meaningful discussions around a number of topics, whether that's poverty reduction, whether that's inequality, whether that's climate, whether that's oceans, whether that's uh, 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 entrepreneurship and job creation, things that fit into different topical areas. And the idea that the UN set out was that uh, after a lot of internal discussion, they set forth these things as organizing principles and objectives then that could lead to further discussion and then action. 
because ultimately everybody wants to to act they don't want to just discuss but right. often action without discussion is a very wasteful activity because you tend to kind of cross purposes you duplicate work and you have no idea why it is you're doing what you're doing other than feeling good about doing something you know, so, that's an yeah. interesting point you made, because after the war or during the war, you saw many people wanting to do something and feeling this urgency to do something. And almost all the energy was spent. And when you looked around, it was almost like everyone was doing the same type of a thing. And you were thinking, what if we all came together and took all of that energy and focused it on one common thing? That way we could get more done versus just working individually. And I think that is where the idea of unity and working collectively together to get more done comes into play. Exactly, exactly. And, and kind of this is why uh, acting collectively will be an important underlying principle. So, so let me then take you from the SDGs of the UN. Of course, mm -hmm. that's not what we have done, but the format is very similar to how we thought about it. So imagine if the UN was just Armenians in 160 different countries who decided what would it make sense for us as, an, as a virtual global Armenian people to do uh, in 2021 and forward, we think these are the, the directions of discussion. So they start out with vision setting in the sense that having no common understanding of the kind of Armenia and Armenian future we want to, to envision means that, that, that we're building completely different things. And, and, and so what, what results may or may not look at all like any of our visions of the future because it's largely, if you just keep working in every, every single direction, you don't get anywhere. You just stay exactly where you are. So I think vision setting and an invitation to those people who have views, strong views on where we should go as a people is an important category. Uh, another important category, what we call assured sovereignty, is to recognize very, very actively, and it's being shown to us, just how vulnerable our security is and how much threat we're under. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to choose where our country is. Uh, it, it is surrounded by hostile elements for all sorts of reasons, some historic, some current kind of geopolitical. And we need to recognize that that threat and security needs to be uh, uh, addressed with a more forward looking ability to defend ourselves. And, and, and that some of that has been done in the short term through alliances, but a lot of that has to give us pause and say, hey, what kind of economy do we need that could allow us to be able to afford the, the, our ability to ensure our sovereignty and our security? It's a, and be, it's realist a be realistic about it. Yes. Be incredibly realistic about it, not idealistic. We have yes. to be pragmatic. Yes. And look, I think that that is an interesting discussion. You're making a very good point because we have had, of course, political parties throughout our existence post the genocide, even before around the world, and one person's idealistics is another person's uh, principled and, and, and dogmatic and, and uh, determined. And the, you can put words on these things to justify extreme views or conciliatory views. And, and at the end of the day, I don't think we can say what the right views are, but we think unless we have a healthy discussion and decide what we are and aren't willing to collectively do to be realistic, we're going we're gonna to find ourselves uh, vulnerable, which is where we, where we find ourselves today. So yes, you that's another. Yes, you please. mentioned the genocide, which leads us to the other point of historic responsibility and the importance of knowing our past. I mean, we all agree on our past, but that's just one point. Well, look, I, I'm quite actually personally passionate about this point. Uh, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd like to talk about all 15 points, but, but this one is important to me because as you know, the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative was born out of this feeling that, that we are the descendants of genocide survivors who, but for the grace of God on the one hand, saviors, humans who helped us uh, survive, or sometimes even chance, chance events, end up now living and contributing to the world. And I think that that should place on us not only the burden of seeking justice, but also the burden and the responsibility of being examples to those who are forcibly going through the same road we have gone through as survivors who had to figure out 
how to not only survive, but revive, then how to figure out how to not only revive, but to thrive, to thrive individually. I wish I could say we now thrive collectively. We haven't quite found that gear yet. But that historic responsibility, I think gives us a voice and a legitimacy on the world scale to talk about what it's like to suffer, what it's like to be close to the end and come back and come back to contribute. Now, here we are at the end of, a, not at the end, but certainly hoping to see the end of a pandemic. The whole world has been brought to its knees. We're basically going through a similar thing. You know, a virus is, 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 is attacking the world in a way that humans have attacked the world during the genocide. It has millions of deaths, tens of millions, if not more of long-term, I can assure you, people who are gonna suffer from a health standpoint. Whose experience is more relevant to the environment we're entering into than ours or others who've gone through Holocaust, genocides, the Rwanda? This is a moment where Armenians, I think, have a historic responsibility to step up and say, this is what our ancestors went through. This is where they found meaning. This is how they got themselves back on their feet and just try to help. So I, I consider that part of a future Armenian in that it should be an inseparable part of who we are and what we can add to the world. That's a really that's a really great point, and and I think it further underscores just um, the Armenian spirit and the resiliency that we have embodied that has um, allowed us to thrive, as you say, and to continue on and to contribute back to society, just as you yourself are doing. Um, we talk about the reality, though, of what's happening now, and the we can't ignore that. Artsakh, for example, you uh, make a point that free Artsakh needs to be something that Armenians also work toward. Definitely the, the Artsakh situation, which has been uh, in some question of late uh, based, on, based on hostile activities uh, and, and the unfortunate inattention of the world to the plight of the Armenians living in Artsakh uh, peacefully for, for a, a very long time now, uh, that that issue has to be central to the definition of what is a future Armenian. We need to ensure the physical security and a clarity of the legal status of, of, of Armenians living in Artsakh, for that matter, living anywhere in the world, but especially in Artsakh, given that that has involved already sacrifices by our nation. We've lost lives back in the 90s, now again. And I think we have to insist on that issue getting to a satisfactory endpoint rather than thinking it's hopeless or it's not our issue or somehow somebody else is going to resolve it for us. I don't see how we can have a, a feel good about our own uh, um, self, if you will, as a people and not work towards addressing this issue. And, and again, we don't have one of the things, Araxia, that should be clear to the audience is that we don't purport any answers to these 15 objectives. We simply are pointing out that these are vital to be able to, to get ourselves to a better reality. And, and nothing could be more important than clarifying and working towards a good resolution to this issue. Right, you're inviting people to come together. If you have an idea, please come and share it. Let's together try to come up with a solution. The yes. next couple points I think we can tie together are Armenian diaspora unity, strong diaspora that definitely goes hand in hand we as a diaspora i often say have the responsibility no matter where we are in the world to never forget our roots and to always think of ways to contribute and to give back that is our responsibility as armenians uh you said it very well uh, there, there's really two related issues as you point out one is that after having been involved, in my case, for 20 years, going to Armenia some four or five times a year, every year, uh, working on development projects, uh, working on humanitarian projects, uh, what, what I would say is that across administrations, governments in Armenia, across different sectors, there, there really isn't the kind of relationship that I, we foresee would be necessary to be able to get the benefit of a diaspora, really. And I think that a lot has been said about the diaspora as a natural resource, as the oil of Armenia, et cetera. But just like in oil, when you view it as a 
a, an extractable resource as opposed to something that you invest in, something you partner with. I don't believe, you know, to me, diaspora is more like education than it is like oil. In other mm -hmm. words, that you have to invest in it, you have to do it kind of as a, as a relationship with the whole field. And, and I think that diaspora Armenian relations are woefully inadequate. They are not based on trust. They are not based on a sense of mutualism. And by the way, when we've said these things recently, we've come under a lot of fire back from people who said, you know what? Diaspora really has no role in the country from a point of view of its future. Very openly, political leaders have been saying this on, on various uh, social media sources. And, and, and that may be the case. It may be that in overall opinion is that diaspora should concerns itself with financial support, tourism, and sympathy. Um, we believe that that's not sustainable if we're going to make Armenia a much better place, that we need to find mechanisms by which diasporans who care about Artsakh, who care about our security, who care about all the topics we're saying, can work in partnerships with Armenians living in Armenia and own the future versus observe the future. Uh, just because I'm an American or somebody else may be an Australian does not de facto mean that I'm incompetent in being able to care for and work towards a better Armenia. But right now, there really is no mechanism to do that. And we need to create those mechanisms. It's really interesting you say that because sometimes I feel um, obviously financially that the diaspora does a lot. But in a way, it's almost like by just giving the money and then just stepping away and saying, okay, do whatever you want with it, you're not really doing the work. You're not really investing. You're not really putting in the time. And that's what the country needs. The country needs for you to do more than just write a check. It needs you to care enough to go visit, to maybe um, invest in projects that end up for generations to come helping the population there versus just financially handing money out. And that's what I'm hearing you say. I, uh, yes, and, and, and the problem is having done this for quite a long time, not myself, many, many others too, there really is no mechanism to do this. There's mm -hmm. no standing in the Armenian constitution for a diaspora Armenian. What is a diaspora Armenian say in the country? It doesn't, I'm not talking about voting, I'm talking about any. And the answer is there is none. I mean, you might as well be a, 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 a Tunisian in Armenia as you are a diasporan. And so it, it's one thing to point that out. It's another thing to say, okay, but what's the solution then? How do we do this? How do we, you know, we have ministries of diaspora. Now we have a high commission of diaspora. That is almost like foreign affairs. Like that's how do we relate to this foreign entity? The question is, is there a view of Armenians wherein we collectively own a future, we collectively suffer like we did during the Artsakh war and, and get come to come to grips with both the needs that were that we had uh, placed on us, but also the consequences of what what losing means and what can we do to to help the people who who, who sacrifice so much. This cannot happen if we're observers and if we're outside parties. So we look forward to a more mature, developed relationship, like we say, based on mutualism. Mutualism means each side needs the other. That's right. what mutualism means. It's a it's an evolutionary, natural, ecological concept. That is, not, uh, 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 that is not the same as, as one entity taking advantage of another, uh, it just, just not. Uh, so, and then, and then I think the other point we make in number six is to say strong diaspora is to recognize that, you know, 100, 105, 110 years after a genocide, um, we, we, we need to think about whether our current structures, our current mindsets uh, across the world are, are tuned to the needs of a future country that is vibrant, prosperous, and makes us all proud? Or are we busy in the diaspora living within ourselves, perpetuating our history, but not working towards some future objective, right? Like in the countries we live in, we contribute to making the country better. In this country, you might wanna work on uh, you know, social injustice. You might wanna work on, on, on any number of food, uh, inequities or food security or education. Those things make the country better. What can we do as a diaspora in an organized fashion to have the institutional capacity to actually make a difference in Armenia? I would say right now, we're not organized in that way. We don't think in that way. We don't think it's our place. But if we decided it was our place, 
we still lack a, the strength in the structures. So I think there's work to do there as well. Um, another place I think we have a lot of work to do, which is one of the points highlighted, strong alliances, not just strong alliances within ourselves, but globally, we need to uh, have an impact where people around the world care for us. We have to have strong alliances, not just people who are our acquaintances. Uh, well, it, it became clear over the last, recent past that, that people we thought we had long relationships with by virtue of either being distracted or dealing with their own crises like the pandemic or for other strategic reasons that, that, that may have shifted, we did not have the alliances we needed to ensure our safety. People did not step in when just basically uh, uh, the, the, the recent conflicts arose purely by opportunism and to test the, 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 the global world order and whether they cared about these things and clearly they didn't. So the question becomes, what do we do about it? Not, you know, not just why did it happen? And the first thing is we need to become relevant to trusted counterparties to and people that some of the major powers find in their interest to, to not ignore in the moments of need. And, and I think that's gonna take uh, a, a lot of work on, on largely the, the government side, but also on all of us in the diaspora. We can make Armenia a strategic priority for the countries we live in. You go to South America and I'd say kind of per capita in Argentina, we have more influence or in Brazil or some of the South American countries or in the Middle East, unfortunately it's in disarray right now, but we historically have had maybe in France. What about over the years making it the next generation's burden to make sure that through the diaspora and presence, but also through our better foreign affairs and diplomacy, we stay relevant to a lot of actual partners, uh, you know, people who really rely on us uh, uh, and, and therefore have it in their interest to support us. A lot, a lot of work to do. Some people may be listening to this saying, this person must be completely uh, uh, lost their mind because Armenia is a little country, insignificant. I can assure you that there's a lot of other little insignificant countries, Singapore being one of them, Israel being one of them, Switzerland being one of them, absolutely small and insignificant. But boy, do they have a lot of alliances that come to bear when needed. And I think that we should not, let's just give ourselves the next hundred years to get there so that we don't have to be discouraged that we'll never get there. It's not gonna happen overnight. But if we don't aspire to go there, then we're gonna be completely irrelevant and vulnerable. Of course, none of and everything we're discussing, uh, this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time, but there has to be a starting point and you have to begin at some point because we cannot afford to be insignificant. And that was uh, shown to us um, a few months back. So uh, the importance of attracting human capital, financial capital, obviously we're talking about the economy, exponential growth. Yeah, I think there, you know, Armenia actually has done comparatively well over the last couple of decades because the IT sector, for one, made it relevant to a lot of uh, external companies. And we saw that in, in, in a small country like Armenia, it doesn't take much to become uh, uh, important and relevant and connected. And, and I think that there's a number of other such sectors where we can be competitive. Uh, artificial intelligence is one such area. A lot of the developments in the financial kind of a, a, a fintech space could be interesting, banking, healthcare, education. There's a lot of places where it won't take much for us to actually be a, a, a bit of a, you know, cutting edge kind of capability in the world where things are being piloted, tried. So I think that people who dismiss that based on size of country, I'd invite them to realize that for a country like India, for example, the size of the population is such that you would need a massive amount of work to make a difference. For a country like Armenia, the size being small, you can very quickly get a critical mass up and, and, and operational. So I think exponential growth, that by definition comes from embracing uh, a change, comes from embracing innovation and having people with mindsets and the risk capital to be able to make this a, an attractive center. You see, you know, places like Dubai uh, in the financial world come from nowhere to being a, a major Mecca. You certainly see uh, 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 Singapore did that. There's a number of, some of the Baltic countries have, have, have leapt 
into world prominence in certain areas of technology. So I Scandinavia is a really good example of small, small countries that are world-class. So I, I think that as Armenians, if we look at the world examples, there's every reason to believe we can do this, but among the things we need to be able to do then is to agree that that's part of the future we envision versus debating whether it's gonna challenge our orthodoxy, it's gonna challenge our, our historic you know, culture, it's gonna leave people behind. There's a lot of reasons not to do it, by the way. There's a lot of reasons why people would rather a country stay the way it is uh, uh, because it's anything you do also creates things that you don't do. And so this is worth a discussion. Yes, absolutely. But I think you're right. I think when you think of just in life, when you have small space to work with or something smaller to work with, you can look at that as more of an opportunity rather than looking at it as a way to get discouraged. I think that gives you a chance to really get your get a handle of the situation. Um, so I think it's all in perspective. Um, when we talk about growing the population, you've had many Armenians, obviously, throughout the years, leave and um, just because of the circumstances go off to different countries and therefore the population has dwindled. You've had also many people going back or have expressed interest in going back and uh, going back to their roots. Um, talk a little bit about how to grow the population. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to move back to Armenia to be a part of this. Yeah, I think, I think that um, this one probably is among the ones that most depends on having collective um, agreement on what the future is going to look like so that people know what it is they're investing in by staying there or by moving there. See, if it's not at all clear what kind of Armenia awaits us, then why would people go there and, 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 and take the risk of being there? Uh, I've, I've long believed that immigration, emigration, where you leave one place to go to another, is something that you can also take advantage of that mindset without leaving the country. And that is to emigrate to the future that you wish for that country. And the way you do that is to bring about change. So you could either move to a place where you think that change already exists, or you can stay and build that change where you are. Both of them takes you to a better place. In the latter case, you don't leave the country, you make the country the country you want it to be. And that always sounds romantic to people, but it is true. It is true. By the way, look at the US. Right now in the US, as we know, based on the elections, that there's half the country at any given time that, that doesn't like where the country is and thinks that they're being disadvantaged by all the people moving to this country and their jobs have been taken away and they are hopeless, right? A big chunk of the, 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 this country has that perception. Well, what should they do? Leave or make this country what they want it to become? Now, in this country, there's the tradition that you make the country what you want it to be. In Armenia, I don't know that that culture could exist because it's such a young country, but, but I, and, and certainly in the Soviet rule, they, somebody else was deciding what country they were going to become, including right. what industries and what cultures and what religion. Right. Here, the question is what true self-determination is all about determining what your future is so that people stay and work to make it happen. And that, that I think is probably among the most important things to understand. And that will result in growing population. People will have more, you know, couples will have more kids into a country of their aspiration. People will move there, less, less people will leave. So I think, and as you said, so we don't have to move to be part of the population because they spend some of their time there and they mm -hmm. commit. So I think this is an important objective that we should have a discussion about. It's absolutely uh, important to have hope and future and opportunity, which will uh, make that point definitely um, thrive and be successful. And, and, and that opportunity comes with excellence in education, something that is important to all Armenians, I think. The fact that throughout the centuries, we have always focused on um, making sure that the younger generations grow up educated. Indeed, I think we need a revitalization, a rediscovery of those values. I think that as Armenians, we view ourselves as super educated, however educated we are. And so that can make us complacent. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have a long history and a, and, and a very kind of, uh, kind of family-based value system that, 
that, that makes whatever sacrifice needed to have our kids educated. And I think we need to, we put this in this group because we think that there's a chance we, we, we are deluding ourselves into thinking we're great when in fact we can be so much better, so much more connected to digital education, access to content that otherwise may be very difficult to create kind of de novo in the country. So we need to be almost experimenting at the cutting edge as a small country to be able to stay relevant and advanced. I'll give you the example, of course, of TUMO that we all know about. TUMO is an experiment in education. It's nothing different than that. And yet it has produced great hope, great results, such that the rest of the world wants to emulate it. What if we had 10 different projects that were TUMO-like? And before we say, no, 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 that we can only have one, I don't know what, where's the evidence that you can only have one. Even that one, nobody believed could actually have the influence it's had. So let's aspire to 10. You know, we use mm -hmm. number 10 for this excellence in education thing. Let's aspire to 10 two more like things. And I, I think, again, if we prioritize education as the highest societal value uh, in, in the future Armenian, the future Armenian, not just the historic one, I think things will change. I think that's a really good point that I think it should be woven throughout this entire thing, which you, you are doing an excellent job in doing. The fact that do not be complacent. Do not think you're fine where you are. Always be striving for the next thing. That is the only way you continue to grow. I say this on a personal level as well, to always be pushing for the next thing. That's the only way you're going to be successful. And you can obviously do this as a society. Um, and that excellence in education, I think, will lead us to the next point, um, science, technology, creativity. Let's continue to take risks and let's continue to push and see where we can go. Definitely education is a competitive advantage in creative fields, in fields where knowledge is the coin of the realm versus physical resources and, and natural resources, for example. And that science technology based society and, and society that values creativity, design, architecture, just novelty, brands, you know, kind of fashion, all of these things where creativity is a part of it. That, that dynamic of, 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 of valuing novelty and innovation, I think that's a society that is competitively better for Armenia to create because, again, we are so hyper connected to the rest of the world that we are one or two connections away, any one of us, from somebody who's world-class at all of these fields. Uh, that is not the case in most countries. It's just not. They may have some people that are kind of in the upper 25% in the world of an area, but we can get to close to the top in any area, enough for us to learn, to, 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 to benefit from, collaborate with. So I think we just need to place science, technology, and creativity at the forefront of the discussion about what kind of future we aspire to, including overcoming those who will say that that's not what Armenia should be doing. And, 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 and why don't we just kind of stick to what we've done before? We've got tourism, we've got our, uh, agriculture, we've got a couple of sectors and let's be realistic. We're not meant for all these world-class things. The problem is our children and our grandchildren, I don't think will look kindly on us for having made that choice for them. That's, that's the, ultimately the people we need to, see the reason we call this the future Armenian is that the future Armenian already exists. It's the current five-year-old. And that future Armenian basically is at our mercy as to what kind of Armenian, Armenian life we create for them. Uh, how relevant are they to the rest of the world? How safe are they? How sustainable is what they're doing? And so that, that's a much heavier burden then, then look, our parents, my parents certainly lived as a kind of a generation after the genocide and their preoccupation was keeping the flame of seeking justice and the identity alive. This is less the issue we are dealing with now, although we still have justice to seek in many ways. Our flame, our, my generation, your generation after mine and their on has to be saying what future can we forge for, for the next generations that they do the hard work of, of, of living in it and creating it. Science technology has to be a big part of that. Talk about good governance. Well, you know, I think governance as a terminology doesn't mean government. It transcends government, it means institutions, it means corporate life. It means all aspects of society where 
we follow certain rules of transparency, of mutual accountability, that of course, not only roots out corruption, but also many other forms corruption can take than the obvious forms we read about, just kind of a commitment to excellence in building real institutions. I think that's among the toughest things for, for people like us who haven't been able to govern ourselves for so long that we don't have the same relationship with institutions uh, as, as with the people that have had their own government for hundreds of years. So we need to learn from other countries what they look like 100, 200 years into their existence and then emulate them much earlier and not wait for it to happen. And institutions, you know, this is also in the diaspora, by the way, but generally effective governance. Again, we lay this out as a topic for discussion. In the 20 years I've been directly actively involved in talking to the governments in Armenia and the institutions, many, many institutions, I would say that there's a level of, of assumption that we're world class in those areas that is just the furthest from the truth. And we've got a lot of work to do and, and we need to all recognize that if we, the better we get at that, the better we should expect the results to be. Speaking of a lot of work to do, uh, just society, reducing inequalities within society. You've been to Armenia many times. Um, what, what is your takeaway when it comes to that particular topic? I don't think you have a, a, gov a, a, a functioning social contract that can have this level of uh, poverty, this level of lack of access to basic living conditions that will perpetuate itself and the desperation that that causes. I say that not because I don't have responsibility as well over that, it's all of our responsibilities, but I think we first have to agree at, in, in ideal of having a just society that does not look at these inequalities as kind of you know, well, they should work harder to, to learn what I know or have access to what I have because much of the, the, the resources people have in Armenia have not exactly been obtained in, in an above board way. So we need to recognize that we need to use government, even the, the church and other big institutions to provide for and make sure that these issues are addressed. Uh, the application of law uh, is also completely inequitably done in the country. And I think these are things, these are big issues. We put it on the table because we want all Armenians around the world who care to be aware that we have work to do in these areas. And by the way, there's a lot more competent people than me, certainly, who can deal on these issues and we invite them to work on them. This is a big, big chapter of our future book. We talk about preserving heritage and the importance of remembering our past and our history and carrying that on. Uh, because it's part of our identity, um, but also the importance, I think, when I think about our heritage, not to just think of the dark times and letting that the dark times dictate our history and our future. I think we have to also find the light and the darkness that has surrounded our story. Um, and, and this is an important thing, I think, when we think about future and children and generations to come, that yes, this is what happened, but wait, we can have all of these wonderful things. We don't have to be tainted by the darkness of our history and our past. Well, Arxia, I, I can't agree with you more. And I would say that any, any non-Armenian look at Armenia's history and Armenians uh, uh, living kind of evidence of what we've been involved with, I probably could write a book called Against All Odds because we have, we have persisted and contributed to the world well beyond our size, well beyond our reach, and well beyond the odds of, of the likelihood of that happening. And, and that doesn't make us, by the way, special. It just makes us who we are. And it's kind of an integral part of, of being Armenian is to have descended from that history. And, and, and I think that that heritage that's embodied in our heritage is something that can be used for good because therein lie the lessons of how it is that people did it, the, the, the cause for hope and optimism that others did it before us under much worse situations. Um, so I think, I think this is an important thing for us to discover. I don't, I don't like the notion of you know, ethnic groups feeling somehow exceptional and, and, and kind of somehow having some, some advantage over others. No, but I do think it defines us. In our history, defines who we are. Our history plus our commitment to the future defines who we will be. 
but the history will be part of our future as well. And I think that rooting what we do and how we behave in, 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 in a strong part based on that heritage can only help us. We cannot become Portuguese. We cannot become Icelandic. We are Armenian wherever we live and how to take that, that experience and convert it into a source of, 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 of good and, and advancement is, 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 that's the 14th point of our 15 point agenda. And I think this is just something that every one of us should really think carefully about. And I think the last point, the evidence-based decision-making is something that is really important because once again, we focus on the fact that we need to be fact-based, we need to be realistic, we need to do what is necessary when it is necessary not just have all these ideas and goals that will never come to fruition. We have to be realistic. The tough part about this one is that, as I said earlier, one person's realistic is another person's optimistic, is yet another person's fantasy, kind of like people use these words. It's really, really hard to be objective about the future because none of us can, can really predict the future. And so therefore it's, it's open season for arguing about what really the future holds. Having said that, I think the main point of what we're saying here is we need to be fact-based in our discussions. I think that it's fair to say that our historic survival instinct has created in us perhaps a level of imagine, imagination about just how good we are that may exceed reality at any level. Now you need that imagination in order to move ahead to take risk, right? I mean, if you're a young athlete and you don't think someday you'll be in the Olympics, you may not do the hard work. But if you actually believe that because you thought you're gonna be in the Olympics, therefore you are, and therefore it's just around the corner. And so now you start buying hotel tickets for the Olympics because you thought that you should become that, that's, that's delusional. And I think that there's a level of illusion around how we talk about where Armenia is, what we're able to do, how good we are, that I don't want to distress people, but is understandable, but is also detached from, very, from a lot of reality. Now, are we gonna be collectively tough enough to judge ourselves, look in the mirror collectively, all of us, diaspora, Armenians in Armenia, all of us, and say, and that's what you mean by realistic, but, but I'll call it fact-based because, because I really think that not until we can comfortably talk about difficult topics and not pretend that they're a lot better than they are. Look, we're having this discussion today. A year ago, imagine us talking about kind of our security, our sovereignty, our dependence on Russia, our peril in Artsakh, losing thousands of people on the one hand to a war, on the other hand to a pandemic. It, unimaginable, right? And yet, now that they've happened, we can go backwards and say, well, could we really have talked about some of these things and seen them coming, et cetera? That's when you start having to realize that just being hard-nosed about insisting on facts in having these discussions, important, important if you're gonna forge the future. It's almost, like, it's almost like a compass. If you're gonna go on a long voyage to a place in the middle of nowhere, there may not be a map, but you should have a compass and the compass has to be truth-based. I think the, um, the dialogue, I mean, is so important. The dialogue, the fact that we can learn from one another, respect from an one another, the fact that we need one another to progress and to move forward. The idea of it is, um, is very hopeful. And I don't mean that in, in you know, a frivolous sense. I mean that deeply that we need the hope right now, perhaps more now more so than ever, just in light of everything that has happened. But I think if we go down back to the basics of let's stop, let's listen, let's discuss, let's come up with the way we can all have that goal and work toward that goal, um, I think it's achievable, but it's going to take a lot of work. And that is the reality of it. It's going to take a lot of work. So you have to be committed in doing so. I uh, couldn't have said it better. I, I fully agree. We hope that people will, in listening to this, looking at the materials, join, accept the invitation and join, join a discussion, join a kind of become committed to helping forge the future of Armenia, uh, opt in. You know, sometimes we, 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 we say this, there's this expression, and I know you've heard of being an Armenian by choice. And, and what is usually meant by that are people who've married Armenians 
and who are who are in some way becoming Armenian by <laughs> by marriage. Uh, I would just invite the audience, and I've said this in Armenia many times, and this hasn't made any friends for me, that I actually would invite every single Armenian on the planet, whether born of two Armenian parents or 100% of all their ancestry being Armenian, to, to decide to become Armenians by choice all over again. Because if you're Armenian by birth, you might ignore these things, because you might think that that's, you know, you're Armenian already, like why am I working so hard for the future of Armenia? But if you're Armenian by choice, like I'm, I'm Armenian, I'm of Armenian parents, but I, I'm willing to recommit to being an Armenian by choice, meaning committing to the future Armenian. And, and that's a very different cognitive choice than a choice made for you by your parents. And I, I think it's something that people really need to think about in our program anyway. We've asked as many people as possible to become signatories to this as a, an important activity in their life, join the discussion, we want to get 10,000 people to be part of this. We've already got about 6,000 people. And then, by the way, I'll preview, we want to get 100,000 people to be part of this because there's no way we can do this without numbers of people who now say, you know, it's time. If not now, when? What's it going to take for us to collectively say, you know, we just saw the U.S. government, you know, recognize in every which way they can uh, uh, the Armenian genocide. We've got to have the hardest year we've had as a country independently for at least 25 years. If not now, when? When are we going to engage? How do people get involved? The average person listening to this um, who wants to know who is involved right now and how they can get involved and be a part of this. There's a website called futurearmenian.com. On the website, it's a pretty simple landing page with these messages, the 15 objectives, and an invitation to become a signatory. Uh, there's a list of some 5,900, I don't know what the number is as of today, signatories. Many of the names you will recognize. Uh, many of the names, maybe your friends will be there. And I would invite people to go look at who's already joined. Joining in this at this stage is a willingness to become more actively involved in discussions, in projects. You know, it might be that you, you decide to organize a good governance segment within this and you bring together like-minded people from France and, and Belarus and whatever, and just say, you know what, let us advance this discussion. These discussions will lead to actions, will lead to projects. Hopefully governments will engage, our Armenian government in the future will engage more in using the popular views that this will embody in their own decision-making and thinking. So there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, the first step is joining a community of like-minded people who want to work around these objectives for the future Armenian. Dr. Afayan, why, why did you decide to be a part of this? You already have so much going on and you've done so much in the past. And one could say, just live your life. You've got a good life. You have a lot of stress and pressure as it is. You're in the middle of something very big globally as we speak with the Moderna and the pandemic. Why is this something worth you taking the time doing and committing to? Well, Araxia, I appreciate the question, but I didn't get involved. I helped found this thing along with many, many colleagues. And it's a continuum of 20 years of engagement I've had. Back 20 years ago, I wasn't doing what I do now, but I knew that I didn't have a good answer to why shouldn't I work on the development of Armenia as a country, as a people. And it's given me meaning in my life. It's counterbalanced my technological achievements, my innovation, my business achievements, frankly, all of which would have made my ancestors proud a little bit, but what I may be able to do a 10th of that in the Armenian context would have made them a lot more proud because at the end of the day, we're part of a, a, a descendancy, a heritage that we need to not only take advantage of, but actually contribute to. And this is my way of contributing. Lots of other people are contributing in their own ways. And I think that we are richer as a people, you know, that are purportedly 3,500 years in existence, at least from a historic standpoint, if this generation adds more than it takes, because then the next generation will add more than it takes. It's almost like you don't know how not to do it, right? It comes naturally for you to do this. You, from your heart, want to do something. Yeah, I mean, look, I live in the States. There's a lot of causes in the States that I could support, and I do, many of them together with my wife. My wife's from Sweden. I have four kids. You know, Armenia is a central part of our lives, and being Armenian is a, is a, is a 
big part of how we think of our contribution to the world. The world has many other people who will contribute a lot to other ethnicities and in other causes. And, you know, for us, this is a, a core purpose. The frustration you may hear in my voice is that we've been able to do so little uh, compared to what would be possible. And the one thing we've concluded, and to direct answer to your question, why do this in this way, is that unless we can awaken in people, lots of them, a shared understanding of the importance of this today, it's for not. And so no amount of money I could deploy any more than what Kirk Kikorian tried to deploy or Luis Simon tried to deploy or many others who've done a lot more than I'd ever hope to do and they're accomplished people, all of them basically concluded that their money couldn't actually do enough. And I've concluded that and I'm not, I'm, you know, I hope I have many years left and I wanna make sure that my voice and my initiatives together with my partners uh, in Armenia, outside of Armenia, can, can make the real change. The, our, our, our capital will, will, capital is fungible, commitment is not. What would you say is the biggest challenge when you look at this, um, this initiative? What would you say is the biggest challenge for Armenia? I think part of it in Armenia itself is a, is an obsessive level of self-confidence about, about already how well we're doing, as well as the sovereignty and the self-determination that they generally want to protect at all costs, including alienating anybody who wants to offer them a hand, a helping hand. I know I'm being a little bit uh, 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 rough in saying this, but that's how I feel after all these years. I wish we felt more vulnerable as a people in Armenia. I wish we were more accepting of other people's input and, 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 and contributions instead of thinking we know everything. And in the diaspora, I'd say our biggest challenge is apathy, disconnectedness, and a general view that this is not our problem or that we can't possibly do enough about it for us to matter. And therefore, you know, let's just live our lives and, and remember Armenia and go be a tourist and, 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 and you know, maybe protest once in a while versus saying, no, 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 no. Armenia is one block away from us, virtually on the internet. It might as well be a neighbor. It might as well be a neighbor, whether you're in LA or you're in Montreal or wherever. Armenia is our neighbor. It's our neighboring town. And we should absolutely, in my view, feel like we can matter and we can move the needle. So there's duality of concern. There's the dispersion mm -hmm. in the diaspora and the disconnected fragment. Listen, I've, I've said this many a time before. The genocide not only killed a million and a half plus people, but also did a number on the rest in that it disintegrated us as people and spread us all around the world. And it is that continuous disintegrated state that keeps us weak. The only way to reverse the effects of that, the genocide, because we're not gonna bring the people back, is to somehow reconstitute ourselves, reintegrate ourselves. And the only thing we can reintegrate ourselves around is ensuring a better future for Armenians. It's, it's, it's bringing the genocide full circle and make, giving it meaning. And I wish at least one person listening to this would find that a resonant thought. Because if you really care about the genocide, in my view, you have to commit yourself to reconstitute ourselves as a nation and commit to Armenia's future. It's the right answer to the sacrifice people who couldn't make it and our parents and grandparents who kept the flame alive. Uh, uh, it's the burden they put on us. Uh, and I really mean this, these are not just words. We need to reconstitute, we need to reintegrate. We cannot work as 10 million people spread around the world, each worrying about our own situation, but not about the collective good. I would like to wrap it up on a positive note though. So what, what can we look at positively that we have going for us, whether it's in Armenia or the diaspora or both? What, can, what do we have already kind of giving us that step up to uh, ignite that flame and the passion that people may be feeling, but just don't know which way to go? Look, we've had a lot of things in the last decade since Armenia has become an independent country that, that we can be proud of about Armenia, about individuals from Armenia and about Armenians from all around the world. Uh, the reality is we've persevered to this point. The reality is that we have a piece of land that we consider ours and we've, we've just got a lot of work to do around it. So there's a lot to feel positive about. And, and, and also we have a kind of a, a, a part of our personality is to survive. And so we're in our element right now. We're in our element. We need to dig deep, 
get our, pull ourselves up again, start, you know, making choices, making choices. These, this list is not 75 items, it's 15 items. We need to decide, maybe there's only five we need to work on, but we just need to kind of, we need to get impatient. We need to get confident. A lot of us kind of sit there and go, well, why should we believe this can ever be done? We're a little country and don't compare us to Singapore or Israel or whatever. The answer is why not compare us to those things? Uh, look, I sometimes I've reminded people that we in our faith, you know, when, 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 when I don't know if this has ever occurred to you, it, when, when, when people get baptized, right? What do we say? Havat, huis, seher yev mugurduchun. Uh, the Magadutun part is a religious concept, but but having faith in our future, having hope in our future, and having love for what that future could bring to the next generations and doing it for the next generations, for me are absolutely important reasons to be positive. That's why we keep reminding ourselves of that. That's what makes this kind of chain of reality continue. So I, I think we have a lot to be looking forward to, but we also have to demand of ourselves that we're part of that writing the future. We're not, we should not read the future, we should write it. Future Armenian, that is where you can go and you can get involved and see how you can contribute. Uh, Dr. Farron, you said something I had uh, heard you say before, which I think is worth repeating. You said, we are proud of our past, we agree on our past, we can't change the past, but we need to become proud of our future because the future is something that we can change and we each can have a role to play in this. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks a lot.